but the, the general state um, of uh, the proxy war since Trump's election, note that he hasn't taken office yet. Um, so, I mean, yeah, if we start off with um, Elon Musk, uh, the notorious, uh, mocking Zelensky, saying Ukraine is independent. Yeah, I'll play the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Перша сильна Україна. Вона повинна бути сильною для будь-якого. Перша сильна Україна. Вона повинна бути сильною для будь-якої дипломатії. Хочу ще раз це підкреслити. Але США не лише потенційний посередник в переговорах. Це країна, яка надає величезні обсяги допомоги Україні і яка може спонукати нас до того, щоб ми сіли за стіл переговорів. Який меседж ви отримали від Дональда Трампа під час тих контактів, які у вас з ним були? Тобто, він, як він каже? Він каже, я стану президентом і сідайте за стіл переговорів. Як це виглядає? Я думаю, що він так не каже. Ми незалежна Україна і ми... Мені здається, в час цієї війни наш народ, я особисто в перемовинах зі Сполученими Штатами Америки і з Трампом, і з Байденом, і з іншими європейськими лідерами довели, що ми, а, що з нами риторика «сідай і слухай» не працюючи. І це не через те, що ми такі, а через те, що так ми повинні відноситись в принципі до будь-якої країни, будь-якого народу, будь-якого лідера. Поважати. Це, в принципі, рівність, одна з цих цінностей, за які ми боремося сьогодні. Yeah, I mean, say what you want about Elon Musk, but uh, I think he's spot on here. Um, I mean, mm. Zelensky arguing that Ukraine is an independent country and the U.S. doesn't get to dictate its policy. Uh, we pay your salary. Like, we pay mm. your entire government salary. You you wouldn't have a country anymore if it weren't for you were the United literally States keeping, and, and they're literally the UK. Keeping... Sorry, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. A timing issue there, but yeah, like, I mean, no, no. I'm just sorry. There was, I, 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 yeah, that was a mistake. But the, yeah, that like, what you got to bear in mind is that, that that literally lights in Ukraine, and they have limited light already. Like it's there are rolling blackouts because of Russia's destruction of their energy grid. It is literally being kept on by the US. Yeah, like like if the US yeah, decided it... to yank economic or military support, they're finished in hours. Like literally, and we 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 are heading into an extremely cold, dark winter for Ukraine. Uh, um, it's go yeah, which is going to be brutal. I mean, we've discussed on the show before that like they had a brutal summer where like you could they couldn't keep the Ukrainians what what few Ukrainians remain in in the country they couldn't keep things in fridges because like you know th there's no electricity during the day um and you know it, it, it that's a bleak enough picture when it's warm and sunny and there are many hours of daylight per day um you know heading into you know winter in one of the coldest places on earth where temperatures hit you know minus 20 um i mean it's it's you know it's it's, it's going to be brutal for anyone who's left there of course there aren't that many people left there but it's also yeah that i i mean i think more generally there is actually a delusion um, among European um, countries, if not European citizens, that yes, that Ukraine is somehow independent and sovereign and it's up to them when the war ends. That was the line that Biden took for a very long time, that like this is, it's for Ukraine to work out their um, negotiation um, and uh, and whether they want to talk and what they want from Russia and they should do so from this position of strength. Uh, they've never been weaker um actually um and yes even the mere threat of the U cessation of usa would probably be enough to twist zelensky's arm into handing over odessa and kharkiv without a shot fired um you know um and i think that just more generally as well though that that delusion it is shattering because the second that, it, that, that there has been a flurry of reports and alex just brought up on screen one of the most notable um which not enough is being made of this but like literally the second trump got elected and note that he hasn't taken office yet um the, the european leaders are openly mulling negotiations in a way that they weren't and you know olaf scholz who was of course the much diminished and and highly unpopular head of a government that collapsed um on the day that trump's 
the scale of Trump's election victory was uh, was 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 clear um, the day after the the U.S. presidential election. Um, he's rung Putin, and they're you know having initial talks um, about the state of things. And as we said on like last week's show, um, it is probably quite likely that the German government killed itself because they were going to get absolutely wiped out in the next elections, uh, but also because um, there needs to be a change in the suits in office in Germany because the, ta- the day will come when German officials are doing smiling photo ops with Russian officials. And that day will, will come, might come sooner than we think. Um, and so the foundations are being laid, uh, uh, laid for that as Scholz prepares to leave office. Um, and it, what's really interesting is that Scholz's comments, of course, were condemned by Ukraine ultras, but other Western leaders and governments have endorsed this approach. Um, and in uh, the world, uh, Canada's least popular um, black and minstrel show um, aficionado, uh, uh, Justin Trudeau, um, he has endorsed uh, what Scholz did and said the war in Ukraine could end in the coming months. So, uh, and it's sensible to start making making nice with Russia again, right? So um, it's quite clear that this is a, not universal, but a pretty a significant, a, a, a kind, kind of prevalent perspective in Western halls of power, if you can even call them that. And I think this is just going to snowball from here. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm pulling up something that wasn't that I didn't put in the show notes, but I think it's relevant because the writing That's is right. on the wall, and nobody is more afraid of uh, a reunif an e- economic reunification of Russia and Germany than uh, Ukrainian yes. activists. Um, so this is from the Atlantic Council mm. uh, by Ukrainian civil society leaders. Uh, anyone's guess as to who is funding them. Um, but they are urging for a renewal of sanctions on Nord Stream 2 because blowing it up apparently wasn't enough. Um, so, so they want Western, they're pushing now for Western sanctions against, you know, Nord Stream 2 in the event that, uh, it might be reconstructed. So, I mean, it's, they see the writing on the wall. You guys watching this now see it. Um, Kit Clarenberg, of course, saw it, you know, 10 months ago, but... (laughs) I see everything. I see everything. Um, But um, but yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, I just think yeah that it's just and if you if you just pull up this video from and again, um, Arnold Bertrand, um, he is this excellent, um, you know, openly avowedly uh, pro-China commentator. Um, He really knows his stuff. French tech entrepreneur who's relocated to China loves China. Uh, Really excellent account to follow who keeps his eye and his his, his finger on the geopolitical pulse at all times. Now, he found this amazing video on French TV of a French EU official who openly stated that EU apparatchiks and institutions had no right whatsoever to even speak about stopping the war in Ukraine before Trump was elected. And now Trump's been elected. He's very happy that they can finally speak about it because it's been such a disaster, but they've been unable to openly admit this because the Biden administration was and clearly remains in its dying days committed to a strategy of insane escalation without any consideration for the consequences. So, um, yeah, if you go down and put on the video, Alex, would be so kind. Yeah, I, ha- I have it muted just because, uh, well, it's French, but we'll, we'll listen. Yeah, 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 yeah. C'est quand même incroyable. <laughs> Le, euh, les élections ont eu lieu hier, et aujourd'hui, on est en train de parler de quelque chose qu'on ne voulait voir, qu'on ne pouvait concevoir, c'est-à-dire les conditions de l'arrêt de la guerre en Ukraine. C'était, là encore, quelque <coughs> chose dont on ne s'autorisait même pas à évoquer, en tout cas, je peux vous le dire, dans les institutions européennes, c'était quelque chose qui était vraiment euh, quelque chose euh, qui, dans, dans, sur lequel on n'avait absolument aucun droit de parole. Et bien maintenant, voilà, on est là. Trump Donc, est un accélérateur. de vivre une accélération d'émission avant de... Oh, that's incredible. I love this idea that EU yeah. officials were just kind of uh, taken to a vow of silence on the realities of this war, oh, which yeah. is what, what, which has been underpinning a lot of 
the work that you and I have both done over these past years. It's quite incredible to hear it uh, from yeah. a former EU official. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, no, I mean, yeah, you, you mean you hit the nail on the head. Is I think that like, and and there, there there are other examples of this that we've got queued up in the show. So uh, stay tuned, folks. But it's like that. Yeah, that this is li a literal admission that the, the EU and Europe has zero sovereignty. Okay, they have to do whatever they have to tow whatever line the empire is spinning at all times without question, um, and. And yeah, to the point that they can't even discuss it privately. Yeah, they probably have like a system of like winks and handshakes, like around like difficult topics that they know that they can't talk about. And it's like, yeah, it's like pretty astonishing that, um, you know, that it's pretty astonishing that, yeah, that we're like nearly three years into this total nightmare where all data on uh, the in Euro Europe's economic performance, on uh, the impact of the sanctions. And again, we'll, 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 there, there's some, been some amazing um, developments on that regard uh, recently, that like it's been so clear that this is a lost cause, that it's an unwinnable quagmire, that it's a complete disaster in which all of the assistance to Ukraine, Western countries are, are supplying, is one way or another backfiring. The sanctions have boomeranged. The much vaunted Wunderwaffe and Western weapon systems, which we were told, as Alex said, were game changers, have been proven to be rubbish, right? Uh, that's bad for their marketing. It's bad for their sales. Um, it's bad from the perspective of um, uh, the West offering countries security guarantees, because even if they were worth the paper they're printed on, actually, the West's power is a lot less than they thought. Um, and yeah, the, um, it, 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 they, but the, it's, there's been a total omerta in mafia terms on mentioning this and like as we've discussed before on on active measures and again as i always say go back and watch our older episodes because they are timeless and they they you know have enormous relevance even now uh, months later uh, that yeah the the, the the media has played this very bizarre game of this using distancing deceptive language when discussing to the extent that they ever do the impact of sanctions on the countries that impose the sanctions and with Germany it's always in the media even if they admit that Germany's on the on the brink of it, of deindustrialization and is suffering major economic and political problems as a result of shutting themselves off from Russian energy uh cheap reliable um uh you know uh, source um it, the, the media will use language like well Germany had an energy shock yeah Right. So, so what, why was that? When did it happen and why? They don't say. Or they will frame um, uh, one country's problems as uh, a, a kind of universal upshot, as if the, the, the government itself had no role in deciding to do this. They'll say like, oh, well, Germany's allies it, um, imposed sanctions and this hurt Germany. No, Germany was at the forefront of this. And we're talking about this major epochal shift where Russia was going to be cut out completely um, from Europe. And Alex has just got a hilarious story from Bloomberg up on the screen, which is that um, the Czech, uh, the government of Czechia or Czech Republic um, is now buying Russian gas again because alternatives are too expensive. Now, there were people like Alex and I who said this was going to happen in February 2022. Yeah, like it, it, it was very clear that this was going to happen. That isn't Nostradamus foresight. That is just a basic understanding of economics and the fact that Europe was by and large and to, to well, almost to a universal extent dependent on Russia, cheap Russian energy to keep their lights on. And when you triple or quadruple that price, which the US had wanted to do for ages, um, then that's going to cause problems. Simple mathematics, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I just love this idea of EU officials uh, communicating with each other in Morse code, you know, like tap three yes. times if Zelensky needs a speedball. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Like, I mean, like sometimes Zelensky just wants a chicken Kiev and but they wink the wrong way and he gets a speedball. Right. I wonder he's so. Yeah.
out of his head all the time. But like, but, but the, um, but yeah, no, I mean, and I think that if you just, this is just, just to close out this section, if you go down to this, um, uh, the PDF, this, this, this case center report, LA. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the case center, and we'll go on to their very bizarre about page. This is a quote unquote independent think tank, which uses science to uh, reach its conclusions. It is headquartered in Cyprus, which is, um, you know, automatically quite dodgy because Cyprus is, you know, home to all these letterbox companies. And I, I, I went there one time many years ago and you walk down the street and there's literally like a post box that has like the logos of Deloitte um, and BlackRock and all of these other <laughs> financial firms. This is like where they're headquartered, this post box down a, down a residential street in Cyprus. But, but the point is, is that it's also run by Russian opposition activists now this report and i the, the uh i've i've yeah that we've kind of skimmed over the, the the cover but it's called dictators reliable rear end um uh which is quite strange and it's all about how russia has withstood the sanctions now um again uh, this is something that we've been saying, people like us and independent journalists and people like Michael Hudson, um, uh, a kind of independent U.S. economist, have been saying for a very long time. But to have it spelled out in forensic detail by like an anti, they openly state on their website that they are and we are strongly committed to the principles of democracy and peace and believe that both Russia and the West will benefit from the end of Putin's. And then there's no text, but presumably the end of Putin's regime or Putin's reign, not the end of his penis or something like that. But anyway, that, that yeah, that, that, that it, it spells out in very, very, very clear detail. And also as well, there's this new narrative in the media, which, well, the sanctions haven't worked yet, but, you know, they're near to long term um, uh, uh, outlook is terrible. And it spells that this report spells out in forensic detail that this is totally untrue, that they that Russia, there is no risk of Russia suffering, you know, a major recession, even which is, you know, part of the capitalist boom bust cycle, and is kind of natural um, in the next five to 10 years. Right. So or everything that you are hearing about how much trouble Russia is going to be in one of these days, we promise, is, again, a lie. Right. Um, and this is without even factoring in. I would imagine that when when this is all said and done, which could be quite, quite soon, um, Russia is going to be economically benefiting from um, the end of the war because they will have more territory. Um, countries are going to start trading with them again, um, and they'll also have all of the you know the enormous natural resources in the Donbas, which is why Britain and America didn't want uh, the Donbas to secede from Ukraine in the first place. They'll have all. Yeah, the, I mean, know, like and... Lindsey Graham has openly. Uh, sorry, just really quickly. Just love like Lindsey Graham has openly talked about how, well, Eastern Ukraine has all of these rare minerals and metal and precious metals, and we can't let the Chinese get their hands on them. Well, um, Russia will have all that soon, and they will have an immediate buyer for them in Beijing. Um, so, yeah, actually, I, I think that the, uh, the, the already positive, and we can go on to this Levada poll. Um, I'm not sure if you can translate it, Alex. Oh, you have done. Yeah, I have. Um, yeah. But yeah, that basically, Levada is... Levada is a um, uh, it is a well respected polling firm in Russia um, and is frequently cited by the Western media. This poll has not um, gotten any traction. It's quite clear to see why, because um, Russians have never been more optimistic with the future or satisfied with the lives they lead um, in the history of Levada doing polls, which is like thirty plus years. Right. So Russians are more united than ever. They're happier than ever. They are more optimistic than ever. Um, and there's a number of charts which are untranslatable. But yeah, that like, you know, Russia, the, the Russians that remain in Russia, which is the overwhelming majority of the pre-war population, are very happy. They're very patriotic. Um, they support Putin. Um, and yeah, um, you know, all of these horrendous kind of um, regime change influencing events that we were told happened. And I have just um, published an article on how a secret cell of British spies was plotting to overthrow Putin by way of information operations, propaganda, um, inflicting losses on the Russian military and sanctions. And this has all backfired about as spectacularly as it's possible to backfire. Right. So, um, you know, don't take our word for it. This is a respected, um, pretty objective polling firm 
um, which the West media and pundits usually rely on for findings. And it is showing, you know, like sky high, record high um, confidence and happiness within society. Um, you know, like everything we were told was going to happen as a result of Russia launching um, its special, so-called special military operation. The reverse has happened. Um, and uh, yeah, it's only via um, de deliberate concealment um, and distortion that this can be, you know, um, hidden um, from 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 people. Um, but yeah, um, moving briskly, moving briskly onwards. Just really quickly, can we get this next this 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 BBC story up? Um, you know, Britain has been at the forefront of imposing these sanctions, and they've been talking a big game about like collapsing the Russian economy. Um, a friend of mine from the UK sent this to me recently. Um, shocking, but kind of unsurprising that British children are pretending to eat from empty lunch boxes because their parents have no money, they have no food, and they're ashamed. Um, you know, and this is the this is the same country, Britain, which is talking about supporting Ukraine, quote unquote, as long as it takes and giving them billions every year. Um, this is like kind of revolutionary territory we're entering into in terms of like the level of, of deprivation and poverty that the average British citizen is living in um, versus what their government is spending money on. Um, you know, the birth of the welfare state in Britain was soldiers. Uh, British soldiers on in trenches and on fields and also on battlefields uh, turning to each other and saying we can spend all this money on war why can't we spend it on building schools and hospitals you know and that was the same across like a lot of Europe um, you know uh, so the potential cause for optimism but also just like unbelievably bleak um, and it's just shocking that this could happen in a country which is trying to as we will get into puff out its chest and keep this corpse of a proxy war somehow still functional. Yeah, I mean, you know, you you made a really great point about how uh, all of Russia's former trading partners, which abandoned it when the war started, uh, will be forced to come back. But there's that, and there's the minerals from the Donbass and so on and so on. But mm -hmm. let's not... It's difficult to overstate the significance of the strengthening of ties that Russia has seen in the past couple of years. Um, the the relationship with uh, China is, you know, haunting uh, Brzezinski from the grave. Um, they're they're closer than ever, literally. Um, the partnerships with Venezuela and Iran are. Uh, so, so not only are they going to get all of their old trading partners back, but they've strengthened ties with with other trading partners, powerful trading partners, which are not in any way aligned with you know U.S. global hegemony. So, um, this is going to be a new world after this war, and because of this war. Yeah. Well, it's. Like, I mean, yeah, and I think that you know this has. And again, this is reflected in my most recent um, investigation on how a secret British spy cell sought to keep Ukraine fighting for as long as possible, quote unquote, at all costs, that they knew there was going to be huge economic damage, both domestically to the UK, but internationally as well, that it would be the end of the SWIFT system. Right. Because you cut Russia out of the SWIFT system because the gov their government does something that you don't like. Well, there's a lot of governments in the world that are like, well, that could happen to us we could be yeah. turned on you know and like ever since you know february 2022 if not before russia and china have been hard at work constructing alternative economic and political structures globally um you know uh they've been meeting with you know leaders of the global south having mass conferences um uh brics uh, more and more countries are signing up to be part of this um there are they are moving towards having a BRICS central bank uh, a BRICS currency um and a uh, mechanism for conducting trade outside US dominated if not controlled um, structures and channels so I mean this is a huge um, uh, I know loathe to you this term but it's a huge paradigm shift and yeah like Russia is specifically reaching out um, uh, uh, to and seeking to build relationships with governments all over the global south where the world's wealth is kept and they are 
in lockstep with China, um, doing so on the basis of mutual benefit. Um, last week, um, we played uh, an interview uh, at the end of uh, our stream. We played an interview I conducted with a Senegalese uh, economist called Ndongo Sambo Silla um, about uh, the crisis of the death of French imperialism in Africa. And we, he and I, I he and I discussed uh, the growing role of China and how average Africans are very welcoming of Russian and Chinese assistance. It's a very different relationship between African peoples and states um, with uh, Russia and China than with Britain and America and France, say, um, you know, uh, and this trend is going to continue, uh, you know, just by sheer, just by just by sheer gravity. Hey, everyone, um, if you enjoyed this video or, or any of our other content, uh, please give us a follow on Twitter or subscribe to us on YouTube. It will help us beat the algorithm oligarchs. Thank you.